<laughs> Amen. So good to have you in church um, today, week two of Talking to the Talkers. I'm really excited about what we're going to share, what the Bible says about making money. Now, this is real practical, real stuff that talks to us a lot. And I think it would be great if we pray before we start, because we really need God to speak to us for this. This has to be more than the words of man. This has to be God speaking to us in a very personal way. So let's just pray together. Father, thank you so much for the power of your word. Thank you that it is timeless. Thank you that it is timely. Thank you that you're reaching us this morning with a word that is so simple that we would understand, but it's so practical um, and profound that it will make a mark in our lives forever. I just pray today, God, that you would really just reach every man, woman, boy, girl, right where they are. And Lord, let's just hear something that we would really be able to build our lives upon. Thank you for a word on Sunday that will change our Monday. We give you the glory in Jesus' name. And Lord, we thank you as a church that Liverpool would win the league. Doesn't matter what happens. In Jesus' name, everybody where you are, would you say a real big amen, amen, amen. All right, let's get straight into this. Um, money stuff is practical it's every one of us let me ask you this morning have you ever prayed for money have you ever you know maybe fasted for money maybe went on your knees one night crying and saying god are you not sensitive do you not see what's happening god you know i need money (laughs) you know have you ever been in need because i want to be sure that what we're speaking about today is real stuff money is real stuff that speaks to real people in a real world um, full of need and of pain and of pressures and all of that Um, we deal with this in very many ways and let's be honest we think about money at least a little maybe maybe you don't think about money except like just once a week kind of a person but or maybe once in a month you're just like oh it's money you know it's not even a, you know but we think about money let's be honest maybe you thought about it in your choice of career you thought about money money was a consideration in you know the kind of business you wanted to start or you know in your choice of you know maybe even spouse maybe it was like money let's let's add it up naira kobo you know let's balance it out um we think about this a lot and it's always talking to us you know and so today i really just want us to engage god's wisdom um, with this talkative guy that is just speaking to us in this world that we live. It's, it's everywhere. It's everywhere you look. Um, whether the lack of money or the abundance, it's just money considerations to everything. Um, I, I, was, I was reading about how that, according to the National Bureau of Statistics, um, 40% of Nigerians live below the poverty line. That's like 83 million people. Um, according to the UN, 25,000 people die every day of hunger. That's that's just what a little money can change, including 10,000 children. In fact, one child dies from hunger every 10 seconds. It's 9 million people die a year of hunger. That's a lot. Um, Does God care about this? Is this something that God... um, God is thinking about does God's purpose mean that you know if I'm walking in God's purpose I'm going to have all the money in the world I want or how does God want me to make money and maybe you have questions on your heart today um, but this is what I'll remind you as we start let's remember that God's word is our truth and it's our authority and it doesn't matter what the world is saying and what's going on out there and what people are doing God's word is our truth and it's our authority so let's believe today that God is speaking to us by his word because his word is not only timeless like ageless for all generations I also believe that God's word is timely and that it's right on point to the situations that we face um, in every single day I'll, I'll be honest with you that even just putting this together confronts things challenges things um i'll encourage you stay through let's hear this through i have maybe like six seven things to share with you so let's stay through on this but but i'll tell you what that it might challenge things in you it might really ask questions it might confront you and all of that um but but here's the deal and you know maybe i'm gonna have hard questions and all of that take them to your life groups hey life group leaders community leaders shout out to you guys enjoy the hard questions and all but i'll just lay a framework of god's word and let god's word be our authority um in this conversation because we have to realize today that we are dealing with a very deceitful person. We have to realize that this thing of riches, the Bible says, is deceitful. In Mark and chapter 4 and verse 19, Jesus is talking about the word losing its power. And he says, because of the deceitfulness of riches. You know, and, and as I speak about riches today, I'm not necessarily going to separate, you know, wealth, riches, all of that. Let's just lump it all together in a very simple framework that I guess all of us want to understand. So the first thing I want to say today, what does the Bible say about making money? First thing I would say today is the Bible says, do not desire to be rich. Don't desire 
to be rich. First Timothy chapter 6 and verse 9, there you have it. But those who desire to, ri- to be rich fall into temptation. And they- hey, let me warn you, if you want to stone me, like these are all those moments where you want to like stone Jesus. If you throw any stone, it's just going to hit your screen. So just calm down, all right? Don't desire to be rich. The Bible says those who desire to be rich are going to fall into temptations and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. <laughs> For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Hey, everybody, do you know what I want you to do? Lift up your right hand wherever you are. Say, I, Tolilokwe Moody, put your name there, not Tolu, put your own name. Do not desire to be rich. I don't desire to be rich. That's what the Bible says. Proverbs 28 and verse 20. A faithful man will abound with blessings. Look at this. But he who hastens to be rich will not go unpunished. And I'm like, <laughs> punished? Like, what's the point of punishment here? Like, somebody's just quickening his steps towards being rich. Um, but the Bible says, don't desire to be rich. Here's what the Bible will tell you, that being rich must not be your desire. You know, I think it's, I, when I watch many Christians coming around the conversation of Jesus and of God and of church and of walking with God, and it's just this thing of, I want to be rich. I, I think it cheapens the reasons for which Jesus died. You know, people give their lives to Christ and they're just thinking, how rich will he make me? It cheapens the very sense of why Christ died. Listen, Genesis chapter 13 verse 2 describes Abraham as being rich in livestock, rich in silver, rich in gold. If Abraham and all the guys in the Old Testament, people are that rich, why would Jesus have to die just to make you rich? So the Bible says, do not desire to be rich. To be rich is not the desire. It can't be the desire. You can't be a Christian and wake up and say, my desire is to be rich. Let me explain how this works. It's like you have two guys that are going to Abuja and you are telling them, okay, you know what? You're going to Abuja, which is the federal capital of Nigeria, but do not desire to see the president. If you desire to see the president, you're just going to fall into the hands of manipulators and of, you know, fraudulent people that will deceive you and all of that. Don't desire to see the president. That in itself is a statement of, you know, you're you're telling them, don't wake up and show up in Abuja and stand on the road and all you're shouting is, I want to see the president. I want to see the president. I I, I just want to see the president people are going to cheat you and swerve you and just confuse you but it doesn't mean that by being faithful in your enterprise and all that you are doing the president himself is not even going to come and look for you but the bible says don't live your life desiring to be rich and so it starts to talk about the love of money this is how people jump into every ponzi scheme jump into from the 1920s days of charles ponzi because we just want to be rich anything the Bible says don't desire to be rich. It will lead you into destruction and perdition. You'll be cheated. I'm telling you. You say, ah, it's like a bridge everybody's crossing. It, like, let me quickly cross before it breaks. It will break when you are crossing in the name of Jesus. Don't desire to be rich. Second thing I'll say today, the Bible says do not labor to be rich. Come on now. Don't labor to be rich. I promise you, if you throw a stone, it's going to break your screen. Just calm down, all right? Don't labor. Or you can pick up your device and just slam it. <laughs> but don't labor to be rich. Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 4. It says, labor not to be rich. Come on. Cease from thine own wisdom. Look at that in CB. Don't wear yourself out trying to get rich. Be smart enough to stop. (laughs) Again in CJB. Don't exhaust yourself in pursuit of wealth. Be smart enough to desist. Listen to me, friends. The goal of your labor in life must must not be to be rich. The goal of your life, when we say, why do you labor? It must not be that I labor to be rich. Let me me put it to you this way. It's like watching a soccer game. The the goal of soccer is to put the ball in the net. Like every game, if you play basketball, the goal is to get in there. In soccer, the goal is to put the ball in the net. And you'd see guys spend time and labor on the training page, you know, planning strategies, passing, tactics, and all of that. You know, just to see how we can get the ball in the net. Because that's the goal. Sometimes, man, I promise you what, if your team is playing in the 90th minute and you get to that point where your team is 1-0 down and you need a goal like desperately, who cares about the tactics? Who cares about the plan? Who even cares? I mean, let VAR just say that one quarter of the ball had crossed. Whatever it takes, we will, t- we will go with it. Because the goal is to put the ball in the net. We can forget about all our values and all our strategies. We can forget about all of that because we have a goal. And the Bible is saying, don't let your goal be that I want you to that I want to be rich. My goal is to be rich. So we'd work. We'll do everything we have. We would labor. But the goal of our labor must not be that we labor to be rich. If rich is the goal, it will no longer matter how. 
That's what the Bible wants you to know, that if my goal of labor is to be rich, it will no longer matter how, because rich is the goal. So come on, let's start again. I do not desire to be rich. Say that if you are if you are following service anywhere online, type it out in the comment section. Say, I do not desire to be rich. Say, I do not labor to be rich. <laughs> Third thing today, don't cheat to be rich. What does the Bible say about making money? Third thing, do not cheat to be rich. Proverbs in chapter 11, verse 1, the Bible says, Dishonest scales are an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. Again, Proverbs 28 and verse 8. It says in the Message Bible, get as rich as you want through cheating and extortion. And extortion. But eventually some friend of the poor is going to give it all back to them. Don't cheat to be rich. Don't cheat to be rich. With God, the end does not justify the means. Don't cheat to be rich. Don't dupe. Don't set up your business wrong. Skills that are not balanced. Skills that are not balanced. Cheating people. The Bible says it is an abomination to God. And I'll tell you what, it still matters. God's word says it still matters. It doesn't matter whether people notice or they don't notice and all of that. Do not cheat to be rich. Don't cheat the systems. Don't cheat your office. Don't get paid for work that you don't do. Don't cheat to be rich. Fourth thing today. All right, I'm going somewhere. I have like seven points. And then let's, let's even see, maybe like 25 points. <laughs> All right, so don't desire to be rich. Don't labor to be rich. Don't cheat to be rich. Number four, don't bow down to be rich. Don't bow down to be rich. In Matthew in chapter 4 from verse 8, you know, you know the story about the temptation of Jesus and all that's going on and, you know, the third temptation of Jesus and how that the Bible says the devil brought him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said, I will give you all these if you bow down and worship me. And Jesus responded, go away, Satan, because it's written, you will worship the Lord your God and serve only him. I just want to say to people today, we still face that temptation, I believe, just to bow down to be rich. Bow down to be rich. What does that mean? You know, I grew up and, and, and I really just thought about it literally like, like the devil just took Jesus up a mountain and then he said, bow down. So he'll be watching like measure and let your head go low and then I'll give you and all of that kind of stuff. But I don't think so. I think it's simply a picture of the devil giving Jesus perspective of all that he can get by bowing down to what Satan represents. So it's like, you can go through me to get all of this. You can, you can just go through my means. You can go through how I, like just bow down to what I represent to be rich. And so Jesus suddenly saw all the opportunities of wealth on the other side. If he goes through what the devil represents. Another way you can look at it, I believe, is that it's just this thing of bow down your standards, drop your values, you know, just reduce the things you hold high. And I just want to say to us today, God's word says, don't bow down to be rich. What does the Bible say about making money? Hey, don't bow down to be rich. I don't care how many people are doing it. I don't care what What's going on in the world and you know all that's happening in my office and it's because everybody is don't drop your standards don't lose your values don't lose it to be rich don't bow down to be rich that's what the bible will tell you don't bow down to be rich don't take up a job that you don't believe in don't don't bow down to be rich don't promote what you oppose don't drop your integrity to be rich don't sleep with anybody for money whether you do it public sector or private sector, whether you stand on the commercial or you just do it low key that, you know, or that my friend that can just touch anything on me because of what I get. Don't bow down to be rich because he buys lunch. Because he, don't bow down to be rich. Don't. Fifth point today. Don't trust in riches. What does the Bible say? Hey, let me tell you what. God's word is life giving. Stay with me. Don't trust in riches. This is how I'll tell you. God will tell you that rich is for your hands, not for your head or your heart. Don't build a security in what you have. The Bible will tell you don't build, don't build a trust or a dependence or in what you have, in what you make. Don't trust in riches. First Timothy chapter 6 and verse 17. He says, command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, not to trust in uncertain riches but in the living God who gives us all, who gives us richly all things to enjoy. So the Bible will tell you to make money for your use, but not for your trust. 
Make money for your use, not for your trust. In Luke and chapter 18, you know the story of the rich of the rich young ruler from verse 23, how he walked to Jesus and he's saying, you know, all these things of how I want eternal life and all that. Jesus says, you know what? Jesus is looking at him and he sees a heart conversation. Jesus, the Bible says Jesus looked at him and loved him and sees that this guy is trusting in what he has and Jesus says, go and sell all you have and come and follow me. And the Bible says that the guy suddenly became very sorrowful because he had many possessions. Don't trust in what you have. Don't build your trust in what you have. This is the terrible story of destruction. And the Bible says he walked away. He, he, he walked away because you, you can't take away what I trust. This is what I built my life on. I just want to say to people today that the Bible is full of warnings that say don't trust in riches. In Psalm 52 and verse seven there's this whole story going on about you know this terrible story of destruction and all going on and then in verse seven it says here is the man who did not make god his strength but trusted in the abundance of his riches god will constantly be hitting on this and testing it in us just like he did with the rich young ruler he will be testing it in our hearts do you trust in that stuff so you are on this journey and saying you know i just want to make money and god is saying are you trusting in it are you trusting in what you get from that in Proverbs 11 and verse 4, it says, Riches do not profit in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. Proverbs 11, 28, He who trusts in riches will fall, but the righteous will flourish like foliage. Don't trust in riches. Let, let, me, let me say this. Let me say this, all right? With all your church mind. Don't trust in poverty either. Because I know many Christians that trust in poverty. That's the assurance of their righteousness. No, trust in God. Don't trust in riches. Don't trust in poverty. It doesn't say anything about you trust in God do you know that this is why we desire riches many times when we start to search our hearts this is why we desire this is why we labor to be rich because of an underlying trust we have made an idol of it because of that underlying trust we think that you know we want security we want security we want some assurance and we're putting it in money do you know that majority of our money worry questions are not even about things in today it's about Questions of tomorrow, you know, when I marry, my, my family, my children, what would happen? And, and we build this whole journey of worry because we have not learned that we trust in God, not in money. I'll say to you today, don't try to make money be to you what only God can be to you. Do not. Do not try to make money be to you what only God can be to you. In Luke chapter 23, there's this story that you know about, you know, the rich fool. And this, this was the whole conversation going on. He spoke, he spoke a parable to them from verse 16 saying, the ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully and all of that. And he thought to himself saying, you know, look, I have all of this now. So in verse 18, he said, I'll pull down my bands and build greater and there I'll stop my crops and my goods. Verse 19, and I would say to my soul, listen to the conversation, I would say to my soul, soul, you have Many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. And then the Bible says that God said, you fool, who, whose will be these things that you have provided for? When God just says, you fool, tonight your soul is required of you. So is he, verse 21, who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. So the invitation God would always be making to us is to say, be rich towards me. Not trying to build a security or a trust or a dependence in money all right let me take that a little further next thing i would say i'll say don't trust in riches next up my sixth point don't save to be rich do not save to be rich <laughs> in matthew chapter 6 from verse 19 hey yeah you're in church on the right day it's the right day for you to be in church come on you need to hear this I'll tell you what, I need to know what the Bible says in a world that is talking to me, that is trying to move my life in every direction. I really need to know what is God's idea. And that's what I'm showing you today, all right? Don't save to be rich. In Matthew chapter 6 from verse 19, Jesus said, don't save treasures for yourselves here on earth. Is that simple enough? Like We're like, let's know the context. What was, what, was it, what was he talking about? Was he talking to Christians or to Gentiles? Hey, he's speaking to you. Don't save for yourself treasures here on earth now he says this he says moths and rust will destroy them and thieves can break into your house and steal them instead save your treasures in heaven where they cannot be destroyed by moth or rust and where thieves cannot break in and steal them again in amplified classic listen to it do not gather and heap up and store up for yourselves treasures 
on earth. And I said, no, he's talking about the treasures of our heart. <laughs> no, he said, moth and rust can destroy it and thieves can steal it. So the thieves cannot steal the treasure of your heart. He's talking about your money. But gather and heap up and store for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust nor worm consume and destroy and where thieves do not break through and steal. Just don't save to be rich in any form that it comes. Listen, anything corruptible, stealable is what he's talking about. And he says, don't, don't. Friends, don't. When God says don't, he's not advising you. He's commanding you. He's saying, don't do this. I just want to encourage you today. Hear me well. Don't save to be rich. Don't try to have a sense of rich by saving. This is why people who pile clothes in their wardrobe, they haven't thought for three years. Don't save to be rich. Don't save for the sake of saving. It's just not scriptural. Here's the deal. Save to use, but not to be rich. Save to use. Don't save to be rich. That's what the Bible says. So Jesus would tell you that, look, if you want to build anything, he would say, you know, there's nobody that's going to build that will not count the cost and, you know, plan it all out and all of that and set his hands to the plow because he's not putting his hands to the plow and looking back. So Jesus would teach you about planning and about, you know, all of that. But listen, it's so important that we realize that there's a difference between pulling resource together towards building something and just pulling resource together just for a sense of security. Jesus would tell you that you don't save to be rich. If you're doing something, friend, you know what I'll tell you? If you're doing something, define it. If you're saving for a project, define it. Let's know what it is. Define it to yourself. Define it. Know that I'm pulling resource together for the sake of this. Oh, I'm saving because I want to marry. That's fine. Pull it together. Know how much. Know what you're working towards. Believe God for it. Oh, I'm saving because I want to get my children this at this stage of their lives. That's fine. Do it. But define things so that you will know the morality of what you're doing. But in the world in which we live, if you're just pulling resource together because I'm saving for the rainy day, let me tell you the truth. Money is so deceptive. You will tell yourself you're saving for the rainy day. But here's the big question. How much is the rainy day? How much is the rainy day? Even when you say I've defined the rainy day, I know that if kidnappers should kidnap uh, my, my father, then they will ask for 10 million. So I want to always have 10 million. What of if that rainy day comes with thunder? How much will it cost? Let me tell you what. Money is always inviting us to put our trust in it for what we should be trusting God for. We are always in this journey of the deceitfulness of riches. So it's always trying to tell you that if you have a little more of me, then you are going to be fine. Five years time of your life, you are going to be fine if you have a little more of me. And I just want to say today, define it. Don't save. Let's be rich. This is why people start to starve themselves. So you are starving yourself. You say you are saving. You are not enjoying your life. You are angry with everybody around you. You are wounding your relationship because you say you are saving. Why are you punishing yourself? Why are you punishing yourself? Define it and know the morality of what you are doing. But don't save blindly. Don't save to be rich. Don't save to be rich. That's what the Bible will tell you. What's the point? So I think of how Christians even make God look irresponsible. So listen, God gives bread to the eater and seed to the sower. Don't ever forget that. Everything God is giving you, you say that you are saving for 10 years time. And you're living a miserable life, making God look irresponsible. I just want to say to you today, save towards something. Evaluate it. Put a face to it. Whether it's a 25-year dream, whether it's a two-month dream, whatever. But just don't save blindly. Don't. This is what happens. Too many people are simply justifying their stinginess. Because suddenly you have this saving thing that is sacred. You know, you, you say no to everything. You don't give. You don't do anything. You don't give to God. You don't give to people. Real needs are in front of you. You are blind to it. It is stinginess. Sir. And there's no morality to it. Because you are saving for the rainy day. Let me tell you what. That is simply putting your trust in money. Simply putting your trust in riches. Do not let money be to you what only God can be to you. Show me. You can read through scriptures. I would love to see. Show me in the Bible where people saved for rainy day. You mentioned Joseph. Joseph did not save for the rainy day. Joseph saved towards a famine. There was something defined. And listen, this is what you even find in the story of Joseph. Joseph stirred up a miracle. Joseph said, you know what? God is blessing us in this time of plenty because there are seven years coming after that is going to represent a famine. So Joseph said, you know what? Let's structure this thing. During these seven years of plenty, we are going to read in Genesis 41 and verse 34. He says, let's collect one over five of everything Egypt produces. 
So Egypt was eating four over five and they were saving one over five for seven years. Now in the seven years of famine that followed, that one over five was not only feeding Egypt, but, but Egypt for seven years was eating four over five. Now one over five is enough for you. That sounds, and then the whole world was eating out of that one over five. I'll tell you what, it was a miracle. It was a people that were trusting God, not trusting savings. It was a people who were learning the wisdom of God, not, not some, you know, let's just say forever. We don't know what will happen. No, it was direct direction towards something. And I'm just saying that money is so deceitful that we have to realize we're in a battle, friends. We have to realize that there's a war of worship going on. In Matthew 6 and verse 24, Jesus said it this way, nobody can serve two masters. You will either hate one or be loyal. You cannot. And then Jesus said, you cannot serve God and money. You can't. If I use the word mammon, mammon means like the spirit of money, the spirit, that controlling force of money. You need to understand that there's a battle going on. There's a controlling force of money that wants to have your heart. And it can come in any guise. I'll tell you the truth. The devil doesn't need you to worship him. He only needs you to worship anything apart from God. And money is a top target. Jesus would never put himself side by side with the devil and say, you can't worship God or, or the devil. But he would say it that because I know the way money is. There's always that tendency in your heart to want to find what you should get in God in money. And Jesus says, don't bind to the deceitfulness of riches. Money wants to be worshipped. Money wants you to be finding life and security in it. Don't position yourself to worship mammon. Don't. Do you really think that we're just in this neutral, you know, conversation? I feel like it's war going on for my heart. I feel like it's war going on for my mind. You know, all right. Now let me start to get to where I really want to get to. And so I've said to you, don't desire to be rich. I've said, don't labor to rich. I've said, don't save to be rich. I've said, you know, all of that going on. Don't, don't, don't. Now, now, here's the seventh thing I want you to know. God wants you to be truly rich. God wants you to be truly rich. God is going to show you a pathway of life. And then he's going to bless and honor. When Jesus says in John 10 and 10 that the thief comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I have come that you would have life and have it in abundance. I just want to say God wants you to be truly rich. 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 8. God is able to make all grace abound towards you. Please hear me well. That you always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. Rich is not a word from the pit of hell to destroy Christians and all of that. God wants you to be truly rich. You know, maybe you are praying for money. Maybe you are in one of those tough seasons of your life. I'm going to show you a framework. I'm going to say five things. A framework of how God invites you to say, you know what, I want you, look, forget all of that. I actually want you to be truly rich. So God will say, let's start from the foundations. God will say, I want you first of all to be rich in spirit. And so in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. Hey, excuse me, he's not talking about material wealth. He's talking about a spiritual transaction that took place, that Jesus laid down everything spiritually so that you can have life. And Jesus says, you know where I want you to start the conversation? I want you to start it knowing that I want you to be rich in spirit. I want you to have the life of God. I want you to have something more than what money can buy. That's where I want to start you from. Jesus became spiritually poor so that we can become spiritually rich. That we can have peace with God. Things that money can never buy. Jesus says, that's where I want to start. I want you to be truly rich. And then the second thing he will tell you is, I want you to be rich in heart. I want you to be rich in spirit. I want you to be rich in, uh, in heart. Because with God, he wants to answer the heart conversation first. That's why he looked at the rich young ruler and said, go and sell everything and come and follow me. Because there's something about you trusting in riches and all of that. I'm breaking that trust so that you can have a heart that is truly dependent on God. I want you to have a heart that trusts me, that is strong and that is focused on worshiping and on serving and on seeking me. That's why you will not cheat and scam and do all the, like desperate to just get anything because you are rich in heart, because you are trusting God. The third thing Jesus will tell you is that I want you to be rich in soul. I want you to be rich in spirit. I want you to be rich in heart. I want you to be rich in soul. This conversation of who you are in that journey, who you really are, who are you on the inside? I really care about who you are on the inside, not just who you are in the pocket. 
And he will tell you Psalm 112 verse 3. I love this a lot. This is one of my strong prayer anchors. He's talking about, the. he says, blessed is the man that fears the Lord and all. In verse 3, he says, wealth and riches will be in his house. Now look at this. And his righteousness endures forever. I just love that combination. That wealth and riches are in his house. But that's not the story of his righteousness endures forever. Psalm 37 and verse 16 says, a little that a righteous man has is better than the riches of many wicked. Proverbs 10, 22 says that, you know, the blessing of God makes rich and does not add sorrow with it. In other words, I don't just want you to say, I have this, I can afford this. I want you to have a rich soul, not one of sorrow and of panic. And you know how many people have money in their accounts and they have no peace in their homes. Jesus says, I want you to be rich in soul. It's about a soul that is full of joy and full of vibe and you know, not money without peace, not, not money with panic, not money with sleepless nights, all of that kind of a life. This is why Peter and John in Acts and chapter 3 were broke, but they were rich in soul. They were broke in their pockets, but they were rich in soul. The Bible says on the, on, at the hour of prayer, on their way to the temple to pray, and they met a man who was saying, give us silver and gold. And they were still, you know, we don't have silver and gold, but such as we have, they are still vibing and working miracles because they are something more than the money in their pocket. They are rich in soul. They are still full of joy and of expectation every day of their lives. The money may not be in my pocket right now, but it doesn't mean that in my soul I'm depressed and I'm... God wants you to be truly rich and it's something about what's happening in your soul, who you really are. To be broke is a temporary financial situation, but who you really are is what counts. It's what matters before God. And he says, I want you to be rich in your soul. I want you to be rich in hope, in an overflow of joy, in an overflow of love. And look at Peter and John that day, like raising this guy. They didn't even remember that they were broke. That's the way God wants you to live. I just want to say to you, friends, today, hear me well. Don't panic because your vision outweighs your resource. Don't panic. It's a blessing to have that sort of life. It might not be a statement of the limitation of resources. as it is a statement of the abundance of vision. That is something happening in your soul that you are living ahead of what you have in your hands. It is a blessing to be able to say, I have more vision than resource, not a curse. Don't misinterpret the limitation of resource. God says, I want you to be rich in your soul. <laughs> Psalm 106 and verse 15. He gave them their request, but sent leanness into their soul. I do not want to be that kind of person who says, oh, God is answering my prayer. I now have the money I've been looking for, but my soul is becoming lean. So in 3rd John chapter 2, this is the prayer. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. I want a prosperity of my soul. Some Proverbs 13 and verse 4. The soul of a lazy man desires and has nothing. But the soul of the diligent, something about the soul of the diligent shall be made rich. Something about being rich in soul. The fourth thing I'm going to say about God's framework. He wants you to be truly rich. Rich in spirit, rich in heart, rich in soul. God wants you to be rich in head wisdom. And so God will say, I'm going to give you wisdom in your head. That is going to bring riches. Proverbs chapter 8 is this beautiful story of wisdom crying out. And one of the things wisdom says, the wisdom that God is sending to you and that God is giving to you, one of the beautiful things wisdom says in verse 18 is that riches and honor are with me. Enduring riches and righteousness. I just want to say to you friends that as we walk this journey with God, because this is a framework of God inviting us to, you say, what does God say about me making money? Listen to the framework. I think about it like my four-year-old daughter coming to me and saying, I want this, I want that, I want that. There are things I will not give her in the immediate. I will tell her to just stay with me. There are things I will wait till her 16th birthday before I give her. There are things I will give her when she's getting married. There are things I will give her when she's 10. There are things I will lay out as I just walk the journey with her. But the point is, I'm walking a journey with her. I'm not depriving her. I'm showing her a framework. And God is saying, I want you to be winning this thing in your spirit and in your soul and in your heart and now in your head. God says, I want you to live your life with wisdom. We're going to think wisely in this thing. We must be wise enough to budget, to plan. We must be wise enough. God wants you to be rich in wisdom. We must be wise enough to ask the right questions. We must be wise enough to, to not just pray before making that investment, to understudy who has done it before. What, are the, what does it look like? We must be wise people, friends. We must be wise. Being Christian is not, is not being foolish. Being Christian is not being foolish. Proverbs 8 and verse 18, You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you the power to get wealth, that He may establish His covenant with you, 
which he swore to your fathers as it is this day. I believe that that power that God gives includes wisdom. It's God who gives us the wisdom to get. This is why Jacob was being, Laban is trying to cheat Jacob and all of that. And Jacob comes up with a wisdom plan that all that Laban is producing is coming towards him by the fruitfulness of the lambs. It's called wisdom that God can give you. It's God that will tell you where to cast your nets, when to cast your nets. It's called wisdom. God gives wisdom. There's something that I love that, you know, when God say God is giving the power to get wealth, something we call the instinct to increase that God gives to you. He gave people talents, five talents, two talents, one talent. But more than just talent, he gave them an instinct and an, an expectation of increase. And so the guy with five produced five. The guy with one, he's angry. Why didn't you increase it? Because there's something I gave you that can increase that thing. I believe that God gives us the power to make wealth. So don't, don't, don't do your business like a foolish person. You just do your business anyhow. How much have you made in the last one year? You don't even know. You can't define things. You can't lay it out. You're just doing it anyhow. So, so, you know, structure things. Do enterprise well. Separate family from business. Separate, you know, church friends from business. Separate it. Do things well. Listen, one of the strongest principles I'll tell you, just by the way, order precedes abundance. Jesus wants to multiply five loaves and two fish to feed 5,000. It's crazy. It's a miracle about to happen. But what does he say? Command the people to sit down in groups of 50s and of 100s. He, he sets an order and then God sets in abundance. Order precedes abundance. If you're building anything, you're trying to, God will give you the wisdom for order. And then it precedes abundance. And then the fifth thing I'm going to say is that we're going to work this journey into our hands. So it's starting from our spirit. It's something happening in our heart, in our dependence, in our soul, in our head. And then it's going to happen in our hands. God is going to help you to be rich in the actions of your hands. I believe that the Bible is going to teach you and show you a pathway through hard work, through diligence, through generosity. These are hand pathways that God is going to bless. I'll say to you, friends, we must not be lazy. Don't be lazy. God blesses hard work and diligence. It is not Christian to be lazy. Whatever you use to cover it up, it is not Christian to be lazy. Proverbs and chapter 10 and verse 4. He who has a slack hand becomes poor, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. Paul says that I know the grace of God. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 10, I'm what I am by the grace of God. Yet not I, but I labored more abundantly than they are. Yet not I, but the grace of God has at work in me. He who has a slack hand is going to become poor. Slack hand. Laziness in all its forms. You know, whether, listen, and this is, whether you are Christian or not Christian, if you run away from work to go to party or you run away from work to go to prayer meeting, it really doesn't matter. Laziness is laziness. And God is going to work this thing that he's bringing you, this journey is bringing you to, into the work of your hands. If you need to pray overnight, pray overnight, but don't go and sleep in the office. If you need to pray overnight, pray overnight. Maybe your last prayer point for the night should be that God will give you the energy for the day. But you must work hard. You must do what God calls you to do. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 28. Listen, God bless his work. He says, let him who stole, steal no longer, but rather let him labor. All right? Labor is not a cause. It is the grace of God. It's the endowment. It's the gift of God. That God called Adam and said, partner with me what I'm doing. The person used to steal. He says, don't steal again. Now come and labor. Working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who needs. Wow. Do you know that you can work and not just have to live, you can have to give. That's what the Bible says. Proverbs 11 and verse 24, there is one who scatters yet increases more. And there is one who withholds more than is right, but it leads to poverty. It says in verse 25, the generous soul will be made rich. God will challenge the actions of your hands towards generosity. God will challenge you towards a life of generosity, of open-handedness. And he who waters will also be watered himself. Listen to me, friends. In the final outcome, I believe that prayer does not just change situations. Maybe you're there and you've been praying for God to meet a need. God will not just change situations. God will change directions. And that's why I'm trying to give you a framework to see what God is working in your life for the next one year, 10 years, 20 years of your life. There's a framework God is working. It must not just be a prayer point of by tomorrow I need this amount of money. It must be a life that is yielding to God's framework of what must be happening in your spirit and in your heart and in your head and in your hands. It must be a framework that you're walking. This is what the Bible says about making money. That rich with God is, is a who you are. It's how you live. 
It's what you do. It's not just what you have. I'll say that again. Rich with God is a who you are. It is how you live. It is what you do. It is not just what you have. And today, I just want to encourage you. Um, in the words of Jesus, as I make ready to close, I'm going to close in just a moment. And I'm going to say something that I hope would really encourage you. Please hear me through today. Um, that we don't just, friends, please, again, don't desire to be rich. <laughs> that cannot be your pursuit. Desire to be truly rich. <laughs> in Luke verse, chapter 16 and verse 12, Jesus uses that expression. He says, look, the true riches is what God wants to give to you. True riches. First, Corinthians, First Timothy chapter 6 and verse 17. And this is what Paul is telling Timothy, command those that are rich in this present age. That's why I'm commanding you, friends. <laughs> he says, don't be haughty. It's not something in your head. Not to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God. It must happen in your heart. Who gives us richly all things to enjoy. This is the goodness of God. And he says, let them do good, that they may be rich in good works. We're not just rich in spirit, rich in soul, rich in heart. We are rich in good works. This is what we dream of, to be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. I'm just amazed. I kept looking at that scripture and I'm just amazed that Paul is starting out a conversation from money and ending it on eternal life. It's crazy, man. And he's talking to you about laying hold of eternal life and he's talking about what you do with money and your heart towards money. It's crazy. Go figure that out. I just want to say today as I close that God is not some mean, you know, I don't care about you, God, that you're just praying. And sometimes we should ask ourselves, you've been praying about that thing for the last two years. What is really different? You think you're in this dragon thing with God and trying to just get it from God and, you know, fasting for 21 days and all of that. Like you're trying to convince God about your daily bread. I'll remind you of the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 6, verse 31. Please hear this. Jesus says, therefore, do not worry. Saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? Or let, me, let me help you update it. Or what shall I drive? Or where shall I live? What are the questions of your heart? Or, or, or what will I, you know, don't worry, Jesus says. For after all these things, the Gentiles seek. But he says, your heavenly father knows that you need all these things. Your heavenly father knows. Jesus says, I want you to know that God is not unaware that you need these things. He doesn't say that you desire, that you just kind of want to just love. No, I know that you need it, Jesus says. So he says, but seek, but God, you know I need those things. <laughs> Verse 33, he says, seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first. That's a, that's, that's a word that refers to order and priority. Seek first. Make it your priority. Make it the first thing in order. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added to you. You know what Jesus is saying? He's saying, don't seek riches like the Gentiles. There's got to be a difference between me and an unbeliever. I can't be seeking things like, I'm just desiring to be rich. Me and everybody else, we're just seeking it the same way. He says, don't behave like that. You have a heavenly father. Stop behaving like, like someone that doesn't have a father. That Stop. <laughs> seek first the kingdom of God. Your father knows what you need. There has to be a difference. Seek the kingdom. Seek to be a faithful steward with what God has put in your hands. Seek that instinct that God has put in your hands to, to be like the profitable servant. Seek to honor God. Seek to put God first. Seek the beautiful plan that God has for your life. Seek a purpose that is greater than what you will eat and what you would wear. Seek to love and seek to serve. Seek to see God's kingdom established. Seek to see the prosperity of the house of God. And let's believe that we would see his goodness. Listen, I still believe that the, all these things follow. I still believe that Jesus was not lying. He said, all these things, your heavenly father, he knows you need them and all these things will be added to you. I still believe that God does the unusual. I still believe that Jesus does the unusual. I still believe that he, he, he has coins in the mouths of fishes. I still believe that he says, don't travel with money bags. Forget all of that. Go. When you get there, I still believe that he has camels tied. I still believe that there are fishes on that side of the boat where you need to cast the net. But let's know what we seek. Let's know that as we seek his kingdom, we have to kill. At some point, we have to kill the world's pressure and embrace the pleasure of just loving Jesus and seeing him establish his purpose in our lives blessing our faithfulness with true riches God is not just blindly instructing us he's taking us on a journey he's taking us on a journey that is 
in our spirit we're receiving true riches in our spirit and in our heart we're trusting him and in our soul listen Psalm 62 and verse 10 it says if riches increase I'll tell you this friends that as you travel this journey and God blesses your hands and all of that he says set not your heart upon them and in our soul we want to be truly rich in all things we want to prosper in our souls I want my family to be happy and to be finding fulfillment in God and joy and love and in my head I want to embrace godly and God given wisdom to profit and in my hand, I want to be a faithful, hard-working steward that is prospering in the purpose of the one who gave me that trust. In Jesus' name, I just want to encourage you today, friends, that God is good. And I don't care where you are on this journey today as we embrace the wisdom. I, I just hope this gives you a framework to be traveling with, to be waking up on Monday with that, knowing what you pursue and knowing what you desire. And I hope it gives you a framework and that we can be trusting in God and leaning in Him because we have a God who cares, who is good. I still believe that goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our life. I still believe that as we travel with God, as we embrace that journey that He invites us to, I still believe that He knows the plans that he has towards us and there are plans of good and not of evil and it doesn't matter whether it's a 2020 Nigerian economy or whether it's uh, you know all that's happening in my business I still believe that our God is good all oh, taste and see that the Lord is good that we will be satisfied of the abundance of his house I still believe that our God is for us and he's not against us and it doesn't matter what's happening everywhere anywhere I still believe that our God is on our side and our God is mindful that we don't have a high priest who is not touched with the feelings of our infirmities so I believe we can trust him again we can follow again we can lean into his framework we can lean into his wisdom and we can build our lives upon this in trust and in surrender believing that his goodness is going to trust us it's going to track us down it's going to follow us all the days of our lives can we pray together today and we're going to just sing a song about the goodness of God we're going to sing a song about how our God is for us and he's not against us in Jesus name Father thank you so much for the power of your word and thank you Father Lord God because I believe you're instructing us you are leading us, you are, you are correcting us, you are confronting us, but through it all, you are inviting us to a pathway of life and of peace and of fulfillment with you, God. And I just pray for every brother, sister, everybody under the sound of my voice, wherever they are in this time, in this season, all that they're dealing with, God. I just pray in the name of Jesus, God, that you would help us to be leading our hearts and trusting you, God, and in following your beautiful plan for our lives, God. I pray that as we engage this conversation in our life groups and everywhere, God, just make your will for our lives so simple simple for us to understand and build our lives upon and God we thank you for it Lord thank you that you are a good God thank you that your goodness is following us in Jesus name and where you are would you say amen amen in Jesus name your goodness is running after is running after me your goodness is running after is running after me with my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, is running after me. Come on. Your goodness is running after, is running after me. Your goodness is running after, is running after me. Time. Your goodness is running out. Yeah. It's running out to me. Your goodness is running out. It's running out to me. With my life, I give you everything. Your goodness is running out. Take all my life. listen to me for a moment I think I think that's real powerful to be singing you know on the other side of speaking about how that life is full of all this 
hustling, chasing, all of that, that we can be remembering that He is a good God. And, and I hope that encourages you, you know, as we just lean over all that this is to us, I hope it encourages you to know that He is good and that He's reaching out to you in His goodness. doesn't matter what you've gone through all week, what you're dealing with right now, trying to have that whole chase, God is good. And that's real powerful. And, and maybe, maybe you're, you're in service today listening to this and particularly want to make an invitation for you because there's somebody listening to me now and you'd say if I'll be honest I've just been in this whole thing just trying to make it work and I'm, I haven't come to that place where I have just surrendered to his goodness have you consciously made a decision this morning to make Jesus the Lord of your life have you consciously said you know what I've laid it all I'm, I've surrendered I've laid my life in surrender to say yes to Jesus Maybe you're in church this morning and you can't confidently say I'm born again. You're living far away from God. I, I want to make this moment just because of you. It's a miracle that's about to happen in your heart. And somebody's going to say yes to Jesus today. Somebody's going to say, I surrender the Lordship of my life to Jesus. And so if that's you, you know what I'm going to do. I'm going to count three. If you say you're speaking to me, I'm not in the right place with God. I want to be made right with God. I'm going to count to three. Whoever you are at the count of three, I just want you to put your hand on your chest. Wherever you are, doesn't matter where you are this morning. You know, God sees you. Maybe you're alone. Maybe you're with people this morning. God sees you. And as you make that step, a miracle is about to happen in your life. We can't just keep going on living in needs and chasing shadows. We really need to bring our lives under the goodness of God. And here's this ultimate statement he made once and forever when he put his son on the cross. And said, this is the ultimate of my goodness. And today, if you put your faith in that sacrifice of Jesus, do you know you can be forgiven? Do you know everything wrong about you can be wiped away? And do you know this can be a whole new beginning for you because of Jesus? If you say you're speaking to me today, I want to be made right with God through Jesus. I'm going to count the three. Put your hand on your chest. It's your time. One, two, three. Do it wherever you are. He sees you. He knows you. It's your moment. And it's a miracle that's about to happen to you right now. As you say yes to him, there's a miracle that he's kickstarting in you. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. Just put that hand on your chest wherever you are. Something is already happening. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. The Bible says we believe with our heart and we confess with our mouth and salvation. Are you ready? Just say these words after me today. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father I, come to you today I come to you today because you made a way for me to come. Through the death, the, death the, burial, the burial, and the resurrection, the resurrection of your son Jesus. Jesus. Say, so I believe with all my heart all my that Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is the Son of God son. and he's the Savior of the world. Of the say, today, today I confess Jesus, Jesus as, my as my Savior and my Lord. See, I give everything to follow you. Now say, I will live for you. I will stand for you. Say, please fill me with your grace. Give me a whole new start. Say, I'm your child. And one day, I'll be with you in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 That's a miracle. And we're so pumped about it, so excited. Can I say congratulations? Because you just made the best decision of your life. It's a miracle that just happened in your life. And hey, here's what we want to do. We want to give you a gift. We want to reach out to you and let you know that, you know, we love you and we're praying for you and we'd love to support you. So here's what I want you to do. There's a link wherever you're following service, whether on your screen, the comment section, wherever. Sycamore.church slash Jesus. I just want you to go there. Fill out a form. Let's know that I made that decision to follow Jesus. And we'd love to send this to you. It's, it's something to help you on your journey, to get you started, take those first steps. But just to see you win in this thing of a relationship with Jesus. Hey, here's the deal. He's already done the big part. He's already died on a cross for you and you can make it work by just taking taking that stand and taking those steps in that direction in Jesus' name.